So today we're going to continue in our study in Luke, Luke 9.22, and the title of the message is The Resurrection. And we're going to be looking at the prophecy, the persecution, and then the promise of the Holy Spirit coming into us as a result of what Jesus has done. And I, I've had a hard time moving away from this text because there's so much content in this text about what and why we're Christians is what Jesus has done for us. He died on the cross and then he rose from the dead. And this is essential content that we fully understand what God has done for us because that is really how we grow. You know, there's a lot of speculation. How do Christians grow? How do we become more mature in our relationship with God? And for me, it's two things. The first thing is that you understand who Jesus is and, and what he's done for you. That's number one. And then receiving what, who he is and receiving what he's done for you. So those are the two things. Understanding what God has done, what God is providing for humanity, and then embracing who he is and what he's done. And this is how we grow spiritually, those two things. If you have a misunderstanding about who Jesus is or what he's done for you, then there's a very strong likelihood that you will not enter into what he's offering. I might have it confused, and I think he's offering something else that he really isn't, and this is what he wants first. So this is why it's so important to understand the resurrection, how that impacts and, and what that is for us today, is to have Christ in us, Christ in us, God living in our hearts. This is what Christianity is about because it's his life in us that changes us, that transforms us, that meets all the things, the needs that we have in life are when God lives in our hearts and we, we develop a personal relationship with him. So it's very important. And then this will bring assurance of salvation. I, I, for me as a pastor, the first thing that I want to communicate to people is that they are secure in Christ, that they have assurance that God loves you, that God is not upset with you even when you fail, that he's not going to pour out his wrath that he's not punishing you. And this is a, a concept that takes some time because it's, it's spiritual. It's not the way humans generally are. Um, God is a just God, and he did punish someone for your sins, but it wasn't you. It was his own son. God the Father allowed his son, the Lord Jesus, to enter into this world and take on a body a physical body, born of a virgin, supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, and he never sinned. And then he went to the cross, and he paid for our sins. So God is holy, and God is just. But the way he has intervened in humanity so that we can have a relationship with him is that he punished his own son. He allowed him to suffer on the cross for the sin of the entire world, so that this issue of sin between us and God could have a solution. Jesus pays for the sins of the world so that now, if a person would say, God, save me, God, forgive me, then he could live in our hearts. This is what the resurrection is about. He paid for our sins. He dealt with the issue of sin by dying. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, he was, I believe, praying to the Father. It wasn't just for the people who physically put him on the cross, but it was for all of us. It was, he said, Father, look, look at what I'm doing. Look, look at what I'm offering my life for the sins of the people. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the, the gospel message is about God doing something that only he could do. And he lived a perfect life, and then he died in our place so that the sin issue, there was a solution. God is holy. Sin must be punished, but he did it himself. He took the punishment for our sins so that now the, the sin solution 
uh, can, can now be removed so that he can now live in our hearts if a person will receive him. If a person will choose to accept what Jesus has done on the cross for them, the payment of their sin, that they would believe that and say, Lord, enter my heart, forgive me. At that very moment, you become a child of God. You're born again. And this is what salvation is. It's a person that lives in your heart. And, and I know this is maybe, it's difficult for, I was in religion for many years, and it was difficult for me to understand this concept. I thought that salvation was I had to be a good person. And, you know, whenever I did something wrong, I had to, you know, bring some money to the church and bring a sacrifice or go into a booth and tell someone my sins and, and you know, I had to bring some sort of sacrifice to God. And I didn't know that salvation was a person that lives in your heart. He is your salvation. And Jesus in you is everything you'll ever need because he's God. He comes and he lives in your heart. And then he begins to show us who he is. He starts working through our life. And this takes time, you know, where you start as children and then he continues to reveal himself as we trust him. He'll tell us something. And if we'll believe him, then he will show us something else and we'll believe him again. So it's we're saved by grace through faith. And our relationship with God is that way. We'll read in the scriptures what he says and then we'll say, I believe that, Lord. I believe that. I don't understand it, but please help me to understand. I'm going to embrace what you tell me, that you did this for me and I, and I accept it. So that's a lot of my conversation with God. You know, just I talk to him about what he says about me and I'm going to believe it because sometimes no one else is saying it but him. You know, the world will say this and you're, you know, that and you're this and people even in your life, you're wrong about this and you're, you know, you're not doing things right. And you feel condemned and there are people that are, you know, feeling condemned all the time and they feel they're never good enough. They feel they're not accepted. They don't really experience love and they feel beat up. But it's so important to realize that God is not like that. As a matter of fact, he is your refuge and he is the person that loves you and that accepts you. And people in, in, the, in this world, on this level, relationships, it's, it's, it's very different. This relationship with God is extremely different when he lives in your heart. He is the one that is providing everything. And as I said, when I was in the religion, it was, I had to do all this stuff, works and give and all of these things, which I still do, but it's because of the Lord showing me to do these things, not because I feel I need to do them in order to get forgiveness or order to get God to love me. So I, I had the idea that if I was a good person, if I went to church all the time, if I gave money, if I did good works, then when I die, God's going to say, oh, you know, you, you, you should go to heaven. You know, you, you lived a good life. And that's wrong. That's not the way it works. The way it works is the Lord has to live in your heart. You have to receive the Lord. And he is the one that paid for your sins. And it's because he lives in you, you have forgiveness. You have everything. Uh, we, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that in Colossians, that you are complete in Christ. When Jesus lives in you, he is holy. So you are. He is righteous his life in you is what's provided everything for us. Everything for life and godliness is because a person that lives in you. And he is your salvation. Jesus is your salvation. It's not by good works or religion. It's a person that lives in you that saves you. So this is fundamental. And it is essential if we're going to continue to grow because when... The world says this, or people say that, or the devil tells you this about you and your failures. You're going to be able to turn to the Lord who lives in you and talk to him about what you're feeling, the, de the difficulties, the depression, the fear, the worry, all of these things that are still sinful. We, we still fail, but now we can look to the Lord and believe what he says. You know, Jesus says a lot of things. He says, fear not. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will be with you. So, so many verses. Uh, he says, 
be anxious for nothing. God tells us through the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. That's hard for me. In other words, don't worry about anything. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses human understanding, will guard your heart and mind. So when I'm worrying, when I'm feeling anxious, I remember what he says. I turn to him and I say, Lord, you said not to worry, but to pray, to talk to you. So that's what I'm going to do. I don't understand the situation. It's got me very upset. So instead of worrying about it, I'm going to talk to you about it. And then the peace of God, without him even giving me the answer to my problems, I just have this peace, this sense of peace in my heart, like everything's okay. And it's him. It's his peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So knowing what God has provided for you and then embracing it when you need it is what God wants for us. This is what he's done for us, that we become his sons and daughters and he can now begin to live his life in us. He meets those needs, but he can also live his life through us. So God, Jesus, he gave his life for the world. He did it on a cross so that he could give his life to you individually. And he removed the sin problem. So now if a person will receive him, they will become a child of God. They'll be born again so that he can now live his life through you. He gave his life for the world so he can give the life to us, his life to us, in us, so he can then live his life through us and we can bring life to other people and we can tell them that the reason we're on this planet and what God is wanting to do, his kingdom on this planet, uh, we can participate with God in bringing life to others, the life that we've experienced we can share it with others. So there's so much content here in this verse, but let's read the verse and we'll pray. And then we're going to look at the prophecy, this, this, the prophecies of Jesus that he would die and rise from the dead. And then we're going to look at the persecution that the believers experienced because they had Jesus in their hearts. And then we'll see how this was all promised by God, that he would enter into our hearts and that he would save us. So verse 22 of Luke Nine, saying, Jesus saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things. This is prophetic. This hasn't happened yet. Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now that is an absolute, we're going to just focus on that last phrase. I know we've been, we actually jumped ahead, but there's just, like I say, so much content here. And I wanted to sort of just make sure that we had this prophecy that he was going to be raised from the dead because it's essential. It's absolutely essential that you understand this. And then you appropriate this, that Jesus rose from the dead. Now that prophecy, that's, there's four there, but the last one there about him raising from the dead is something that only God could do. You gotta, you gotta remember, Jesus, he upset the religious establishment. On multiple occasions, he went to Jerusalem, he flipped over tables at one point, he got them really mad, he, he got a whip, he made a whip and he chased all the money changers out of the temple. The religious establishment was outraged that he did this, and they had a warrant out for his arrest. They wanted to kill Jesus. Okay. So someone could say, well, you know, Jesus, yeah, you were crucified, you know, even though you, you, know, you, were, you said you would go to Jerusalem, that you would suffer, that you would be rejected by the religious establishment, that they would kill you. That's not really supernatural. I mean, you know, you did do a lot of things to these people to get them really mad at you, the religious establishment. They had a warrant. That's not really... You know, that, that might be a, just sort of a coincidence that you sort of made happen because you got these people mad and they wanted to kill you and then they actually did kill you. So that'd be one thing. But now 
Think about this statement that he says three days after he's dead, he will raise from the dead. Now that is absolutely supernatural. You just ponder that, that he is saying, not only after they kill me, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. After three days, I will literally physically rise from the dead. Now, we know this is factual. It's true. This is why we're here today. There was over, there was 10 different appearances of Jesus. After he rose from the dead, he appeared to over 500 people at one time. So these people, over a period of 40 days, after Jesus was crucified, he rose from the dead for 40 days. He appeared multiple times to Mary. He ate with his disciples. They touched him. Thomas touched him. So now, you know, th this, is, this is taking it way beyond coincidence. If someone says, I'm going to get arrested and they're going to kill me, well, yeah, if they got a warrant and uh, your capital crime, that might very well happen to you. But then to say that you're going to be raised from the dead three days after they kill you, that's taking this prophecy to a completely different level. So that is what in fact happened. Jesus was killed, he was buried, and then three days later, he raises from the dead. And they now are telling everyone, the disciples that saw Jesus, touched him, ate with him after he rose from the dead. Remember, the first time he appeared to them, they were hiding. They were afraid of the Jews, his apostles, because they thought that the religious leaders were going to arrest them next because they were with Jesus. They were Jesus' disciples. So they were afraid and hiding, and Jesus appears right in the room while they're there with all the windows and the doors shut for fear of the Jews. And he says, peace be unto you. That's what God says. He says, peace. He appears to them. He says, peace. And their eyes were opened, and he breathed on them the Holy Spirit, and he enters into them. So now they know. Now they believe, and this is the gospel. You believe that Jesus died for your sins, and he rose from the dead to live in your heart so that you receive him. That's when a person becomes a Christian. So now they're telling everyone that, in fact, God did accept Jesus' sacrifice, he rose from the dead. He's still alive because God received his life, his perfect life for our sinful lives. There was a, there was a, a, a substitution. He paid his perfect life for our sinful lives. And now he's able to live in us. So they're telling everyone in Jerusalem, and this is when the persecution begins. This is when they're going to be persecuted because they're telling everyone who Jesus is now, that they clearly know that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, that he rose from the dead, that they saw him, and he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. They're like different people, and this is what happens. When the, when the Lord enters your heart, that's when you become a Christian. That's when you're saved. And now they have boldness, and now they're preaching in Jerusalem, the same place where they were, Jesus was crucified, and they were being persecuted. And in Acts chapter 2, we're look at a few verses in Acts to look at the persecution because Jesus rose from the dead and that's what they were declaring in verse 22. This is uh, Peter's message on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured upon them. In verse 22, you see this pattern of what the disciples were preaching, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus was crucified, Number three, that Jesus rose from the dead. And number four, Jesus is returning. Those are the four points pretty much in all of the book of Acts, in all of their sermons, Paul's sermons and, and Peter's sermons. So this is Peter's first sermon. He says, men of Israel, Acts 2.22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst. So Jesus is their Messiah. You know who he is. He did miracles. People are still alive. People that he healed. Lazarus, he raised him from the dead. These people were all in Jerusalem. So Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior of the world. So this was the first point in a lot of their preaching. In Acts, and then the verse 23, the next, the next verse, Acts 2.23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. This is the second point of all their sermons, that they killed him, that Jesus was crucified. Verse four, uh, 24, whom God raised up, 
having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So that's the third point you see over and over, that Jesus rose from the dead. He says, whom God raised up. And then if you go down to verse 31, 231, Acts 231, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of whom you are all witnesses. So now Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he is going to continually preach this message about Jesus. You know who he is. We were, you guys killed him. He was buried, but we're here to tell you that we've met him again. He rose from the dead. He has appeared to us. Now, this is what gets people into trouble. This is what got the apostles in trouble because they were declaring that Jesus had risen from the dead, and there's tremendous implications to this. And let's look at the next sermon that Peter is going to be involved with in Acts 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 1. A, a man was healed, a, a man that was born crippled. God healed him through Peter. Peter then takes that opportunity after the miracle to proclaim that Jesus is the one that healed this man. Jesus is alive. He's now doing miracles basically through us. He was doing miracles. Now the same type of miracles are happening right through the apostles because Jesus is now in them. Jesus is living in their hearts. But in verse 1, Acts 4, Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This is why they're upset. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. 5,000 people. So... The religious leaders, he mentions the priests, this, the, uh, this, the Sadducees, the captain of the temple. Just like Jesus said that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer many things, he's going to be rejected. by the. So now the apostles are dealing with the same thing. The same religious establishment is rejecting them. And they're very upset. This phrase here in, in verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, let's talk, let's, this, they were greatly disturbed. Um, let me draw a little word picture. So if you picture a pond that's placid, beautifully, you know, just like calm, looked like glass, little cloudy, little sunny day, you can almost see the reflection of the sky on the pond. It's just so clear. Imagine someone taking a rock and throwing it into the water, just push, and then the waves, it starts rippling, the picture dis disintegrates. So this is what it means, it's greatly disturbed. It's like what humans go through. You're, you're just nice and calm, and you're just going through life, and then somebody does something to you, or in a car cuts you off, and then immediately it's like it was, you were nice and calm, and then all of a sudden it's like someone threw a rock, and push, and you just, it's disrupting you. They were greatly disturbed. Because they were preaching that Jesus had risen from the dead. They were telling people. This is what got them in trouble. You see, it would not be a surprise to anyone if they said, you know, Jesus was a good man and, you know, Jesus, you, you, you crucified Jesus. Yeah, we all know that. We, we crucified him. We know we crucified him. There's no, yeah, what, what, you know, what, he deserved it. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying that he rose from the dead and they're meeting with him. And they were infuriated by that because the implications of what that means. For the apostles to say that they're meeting with Jesus, all these religious leaders are now, go that you're implying that he was the Messiah and that we killed our Messiah. And the implications of this would be that everything Jesus said would be true. Everything else he said would be true. And Jesus made a lot of 
radical statements about who he was and what he came to do. I'll give you a few. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except they come through me. I mean, that's pretty radical. He says, no one can get to God unless they come through me. In John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one, that he is God. In John 2, 19, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. He's talking about his body that would be crucified and killed. Jesus said in John 8, 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, before Abraham, the, the, the founder of Judaism, before Abraham existed, I am. In other words, I'm the God that appeared to Abraham. When they heard that, they were outraged, the religious establishment. So the implications of these guys going around telling people that Jesus rose from the dead was they're saying that we killed our Messiah, that we killed the Son of God who came to save us. And that's what John says. He came to his own, but his own rejected him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Anyone that will receive him, the Lord will give power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name. So they are greatly disturbed. Did we kill our Messiah? Many priests believed. Many of these religious people, if you go through the book of Acts, you discover that Many of them, they started believing because Jesus was appearing. There's 5,000 people. Imagine having 5,000 people in Rochester talking about them seeing the Lord Jesus after he rose from the dead. The implications of that, what, what that would mean, that it would mean that he's God. No one, no one has ever survived a Roman crucifixion. These guys were professional executioners. They knew exactly how to kill people and make sure that they were killed. They'd go around with a mallet and break kneecaps just to make sure that if you hung on the cross and you, know, you were dead, there's just no way you're going to survive a crucifixion, much less be put in a tomb for three days with no water, no food. I mean, and then come back to life and start appearing to people? That means that he's God. He's got to be God. Who could do something like that? And Jesus predicted it in the prophecy. He said exactly. And now look, the religious establishment is after the apostles. They beat Peter. They arrest him because he's going around saying that they are meeting with God. And they've become different people. And this is what you, we want to see here. The con, the, you know, there's so much content about a Christian relationship because Jesus lives in your hearts. He, he rose from the dead. So his spirit can live in you. This is what salvation is, is when he lives in a person's heart. So this is what Jesus promised that would take place, that once he rose from the dead, he would send the Holy Spirit to live inside of those who would believe him, those that would believe what he did on the cross, but paying for their sins, and those that would embrace his life into their hearts. In John chapter 14, verse 16, this is the promise that Jesus made. Before he died, he told them he was going to die. This is the Last Supper. John 14, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be where? In you. So Jesus, because these apostles were with him, they were experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit all the time. They were even doing miracles themselves while Jesus was with them. But now he's saying, I'm going to leave. He's going to the cross. He's going to pay for their sins, for the sins of the world, so that this problem of sin between God and man, this, this, this problem could be solved. There could be a resolution between God and men, so that God is holy, sin has to be punished, but God loves us and wants to live in us. And the problem was our sin, so the, the solution was that God would die for your sins, that he would pay for your sins. He would solve the problem 
of this barrier between you and God so his holiness, so he could live in us by his spirit because Jesus paid it. I'm going to explain this because this is a little bit maybe difficult, especially if you're coming out of a religious background like I was. It took, it took years to understand this. And, and a lot of people still, they, they refuse to accept what Jesus did for them. They, they feel they have to add something to it. That, you know, it's not that easy. What Just accept the life of God into my heart. Um, so it's okay. It takes time, but uh, we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit more. The promise, so Jesus predicted the prophecy that he was going to die, be rejected, raised from the dead. Then it happened. The disciples were now telling everyone in Jerusalem, doing miracles, they started getting persecuted. But this is really wrapped in the promise that's still for us today. And the same thing is going on today. The same things are happening. Um, people are getting saved because they're believing that Jesus died for their sins, that he rose from the dead. When someone believes that, whether they understand fully what's taking place, when a heart reaches, to, reaches out to God in sincerity, the Holy Spirit sees this, and he enters into you. Now, you might not be able to explain all of that. It's like a baby when you first were born. You're two days old. You, you can't even talk. You, you know, you just, your parents are right there feeding you, but you don't even really know that they're your parents. Even at three months and four months, the kid just starts, then he starts recognizing daddy and, or mommy, and they smile at three months when they see you. And you go, oh, look, he's starting to know who I am. But, you know, someone could grab your kid, and the kid would grow up never knowing that you're not the real parents or who the real parents are. So spiritually, there's sort of like a parallel like that. When you're born spiritually, the Lord comes into you, but we're like babies, you know, baby Christians. And, and then he starts feeding us and loving us. And as we grow, we begin to grow and discover who he really is. So Jesus promised this. He told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come after I rise from the dead, and he's going to live in you. In Luke chapter 3, we, we studied this, verse 16, John answered, saying to, to all, this is John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to lose, he will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and with fire. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Paul says the same type of thing. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells where? In you, in our hearts. He then says, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Our bodies will be glorified at some point like Jesus's was. He will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells where? Where does the Holy Spirit dwell now? In the hearts of believers, in the hearts of the Romans, in the hearts of anyone that believes. In 1 John 4.13, uh, John says, By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us his spirit. He gives it, he lives in us. This is what is essential to understand about the resurrection. That Jesus rose from the dead, it validates that God accepted his sacrifice for the sins of the world. That the Father did in fact forgive the world like Jesus asked him to as he was dying. But then now he sends the Holy Spirit to live in the hearts of those who believe. In all of us. In Titus 3.6, this is the spirit you know, that whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So these are just a few verses, but it's dealing with this promise. Jesus said that those that follow him would also have the Holy Spirit living in their hearts. Now this, like you say, it's, it's a little bit difficult for religious people. Like I, it took me a while to, to understand this because I, I was coming out of so much religion that whenever I failed, I sinned, that I would have to pay God, I'd have to bring some money to church, some tithe or something, or I'd have to, you know, I, like, you know, say certain prayers, like, this is your punishment, say these prayers. You gotta say eight of those prayers and three of those prayers, and you gotta bring some sort of sacrifice to God. And I didn't understand that salvation is a person, it's not a religion, it's not works, it's not, 
um, something that I have to perform or something that I have to complete. It's something I have to believe and receive. This is who God is. This is what he's done. He loves the world. He died for the world so that he could live his life in us and give us life. And he could meet our needs and then live his life through us as he meets our needs. We can tell others the, the, the key to life is that God would live in your heart. He is the one because he's God, his spirit. He could provide everything you'll ever need. He is everything, including the forgiveness of your sins. That's huge because there's a lot of people like I was condemned, feeling condemned a lot. And I didn't understand what Jesus did on the cross and why, as he rose from the dead, why God could now live in me because I still sin. I still fail. And uh, people will let you know that. Your wife will let you know that you're not perfect. Uh, she lets me know regularly, and I appreciate that. But, you know, people can hold things against you, your brother, maybe your, your cousin's mad at you or some other family member, and they say, you did me wrong. You know, you did this, and it's like you sinned against them, and I'm not forgiving you. And Okay, so that's all real in a horizontal way, but not in a vertical way with God. God is not holding your sins against you. This is what's essential. He has forgiven you completely so that you can live with forgiveness. So now you can live your life, and everything that God gives you, you can now live it out and share it with other people. So this is, this is why this is huge that we understand this. To understand what, how you can be a forgiven person and not be, you know, like sinless or anything. I'll use a couple of examples because it is a legal term. Jesus made reconciliation for humanity. When Jesus died on the cross, he was reconciling the world to himself, to God. The word reconciliation has to do with like discharging. It's like repairing a, a bad relationship. But it's, a, it's an accounting term that means that you had a debt that you couldn't pay. And so somebody discharged the debt. And I'll give you an example because it is like a mortgage. It's the idea of you, let's say, take out a mortgage. It's a 30-year mortgage. And you have 30 years of payments. And after, let's say, two years into the mortgage, you lose your job, you start having financial problems, and you, and you can't get a job, so you can't pay your mortgage. So you start getting backed up. And let's say someone like that were to, were to come to me and talk to me, and let's say I had the money. Let's say it's a $200,000 mortgage, you still owe 198000 And uh, let's say I go home and the Lord puts it, you know, Dan, you should go pay that person's mortgage off. And then I, I said, you know, okay, God, I'll do that. You've given me the money. And I'll go to the bank and say, hey, listen, do you have a customer named this? Yes, we do. Well, I want to pay their mortgage, but I don't want you to tell them that it was me that paid it off. So I pay off the mortgage, and then the person goes to pay a payment, and they say, your mortgage is paid. They write a check. What? It's paid. It's been discharged. What do you mean discharged? I still owe 30 years. No, it's been paid, completely paid, in full, discharged. All the future payments are paid. This is what Jesus did. You owed a life of sin, future sins. For 30 years, you're going to be sinning if you're here. But when Jesus died, he paid for all of your sins, all of your future sins. He paid for all of your past sins. Now, let me use another legal word picture so that we can understand this concept. Because, in fact, I think I probably shared this with you before. But I got, as a young Christian... I was a new believer, and I was going to the airport, and I was speeding, and I was speeding. And I go around 390 there, and there's a little, like, medium where the cops usually hang out, right by the airport, because they know everybody's speeding to get to the airport. And he had a gotcha gun. Think He gets me. Woo! Pulls me over. You're speeding, I know. Here's a ticket. you got to pay this ticket or go to court. And so I called my insurance agent. And I was a young Christian. He goes, you know, if you, if you admit and you say guilty and you pay it, the insurance company says, oh, look, he admitted it. So we can boost up his rates a little bit because he's admitting to it. But if you say not guilty, you know, maybe something will happen. Maybe the cop won't show up or something. You can get it taken care of. So I did. I prayed, went to court, night court. And we go to court. I'm waiting there. All the people with attorneys go first. And finally, the tickets... Mr. Crespo, you in the court? Yes, sir, I'm right here. Come up to the bench. Okay, I see you have a ticket here. You're pleading not guilty? Yes, sir. 
Uh, he looks at the bailiff. Is the officer here that issued the ticket? Uh, no, sir, he's not here tonight. He couldn't make it. He goes, well, the officer's not here, Mr. Crespo. I said, well, sir, I'm here, and uh, I'm going to ask you to discharge the ticket because I'm here and he's not. And he looked at me, smiled, he said, okay, boom, discharged, go. You're done. <laughs> I walked out of the courtroom. I said, oh, God, thank you. I was justified for that, that sin that I committed, it was just like I never had done it. I was acquitted. It, was, it wasn't even on my record. It, New York State could not put it on my record. I didn't have to pay the penalty. I was just like I never did it. That's what justification means. There is no record of this, but I was guilty. I was speeding and I did deserve the punishment. So this is what Jesus has done for those who will receive his life into their hearts. When you receive the life of Christ, he rose from the dead, he is alive today, he is in this room today, and when you open your heart and say, Jesus, I believe that you paid for my sins, that you discharged them on the cross, that you are God, and that you rose from the dead and proved that God accepted your sacrifice and that you are, in fact, the Son of God, the creator of this planet, and the savior of the world. And that you did that because you love me personally. Lord, save me. I, I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge that you did that on the cross for me. When you do that and you open up your heart, the Holy Spirit sees the sincerity of your heart. He enters into you and now Jesus living in you is what makes you saved. Salvation is a person. Salvation is not a religion or ceremonies or rituals that you perform or money that you're giving. It is a person that lives in your heart. This is what Jesus promised. He says, I'm going to go. This is all prophecy. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to suffer for you. I'm going to be crucified for you. They're going to kill me. And what I'm actually doing is paying for everyone's sins. And then I'm going to rise from the dead and send the Holy Spirit to live in the hearts of those who will believe me and trust me and receive me so that I can live my life in them. So this is what the resurrection is about, that we would live and receive God, live with God and receive the Holy Spirit. This is... Um, a little bit of a difficult concept, like I say, for people that are coming out of religion to believe that Jesus has done it all. That he is my holiness. I'm holy because of a person that lives in me. I'm sanctified because of a person that lives in me. Jesus said that I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. The abundant life is his life. Jesus came to give his life so that we could have abundant life when he's living in our hearts. And he has justified us for all of our past sins, just like we've never done it. When Jesus enters your heart, you are discharged from all of your future sins. He paid them all, past, present, and future. Now, a lot of people, they, they just think, oh, does that mean I can keep sinning then because Jesus forgave me? Absolutely, this is what happens. See, this is when he enters your heart, you don't stay the same. He starts changing your heart through his spirit that lives in you. Now, this takes time. You can't be in a hurry. You know, we want to grow faster than we really can. It takes time. But what begins to happen is God now starts living his life and interacting with you in such a way that he will show you, listen, I can meet those desires that you have. You don't have to go to the world. You don't have to listen to the devil tempting you over here to get peace and joy. I can do that for you. I will give you that. I've already, so as we learn how to discuss and understand this and discuss it with them, we begin to appropriate it and experience it. So for instance, I could be in a situation where I get stressed out. You know, there's a lot of things, you know, if you're stressed out, it's good. It's good if you're depressed because that means your emotions are working. But um, in the midst of difficulties and surprises and you know, I get disturbed, greatly disturbed, like this placid, my calm heart, just someone throws a rock in there. Um, I will feel upset. And I've learned to say, Lord, if it's no peace, I'll say, Lord Jesus, you said peace, I leave with you. 
My peace I give to you. And Lord, I receive your peace. I try to take my mind off the situation and I put him on the Lord. And I begin to talk to him about what he says. He says that he has already given me peace. That he is my peace. And I will then, the Holy Spirit will give me peace. Maybe not even the answers, but I will have this wonderful, glorious peace in my heart. That nothing out here changes, but he changes me, and I'm at rest, and I'm at peace in the midst of storms and difficulties, whatever people are going to do, whatever is going to happen. I have peace, joy. You know, Jesus said, my joy. It's his joy. So it's everything you need is in a person that you can have a relationship who lives in your heart, who wants to provide all of these things. When I'm feeling anxious, Paul says, you know, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. That's what he's saying. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. That means talk to God in supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses human understanding will guard your heart and your mind. Now, that's absolutely true. I experience it all the time, and so can you, and you should. As you begin to learn these things, you're going to realize that the world is going to throw this at you. People are going to throw this. The devil is going to throw this. Even yourself, you'll condemn yourself all the time. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm, I'm not a good mother. I, I'm such a failure. I'm always, you know, you're worried and anxious about, oh, my kids are going to come out monsters. I'm a, t- I'm a terrible parent. And No. <laughs> I know, uh, you know. I I remember, you know, other moms, it's just so easy to get condemned, like you're not good enough, or you're worried and fearful. Their kids are going to be fine. God's in control. The best thing they, they, they can see is a mom and a dad that are at peace, that love Jesus, that are trusting God, and allow, I remember when we were on the mission field, uh, we were, we didn't have money for rent. We were like five days late. And uh, so we got together, and I prayed with Gina. Gina's a little girl. You know, they're like 11. And we prayed, and I go to the mailbox, and there's a check for 1500 bucks. A, a friend of mine sent it a, from a different church. And this used to happen. It happens all the time. But the Lord was telling me, you know what? You should bring your children into the experience of the miracles that I'm doing for you so they can realize how this actually works. Because sometimes parents don't think about their children, bringing their children into the actual experience. And look what God did. So I said, Gina, look at how God answered your prayer, our prayer. And look, open it. There's a check there. And she opened it up. She took it out of the envelope. And see, we thank the Lord and we ask God, he will provide my needs because the Bible says he will. And God shall provide all of my needs. And he does. So whenever I'm doubting that, I talk to the Lord about it. He might not tell me anything, but he just gives me peace. And then I know it's okay. He's he's got it. And then sure enough, a day or two or whatever, a week, it's exactly, he is so faithful. He is so faithful. He wants to provide everything that you need. But I get anxious about the future. I I forget that he's living in me and that I can talk to him. And if he says, you know, if 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 he lets me do it my way, if I if I want to worry, and instead of talking to him, if I if I want to be anxious, if I want to be depressed, if if I want to be whatever greedy, he says, okay, then you know, let's go ahead. I'm not gonna interfere with your life. But you learn that. This is salvation. He's a person that lives in me. And you begin to discover this to be absolutely real. That now that I talk to him about all the difficulties, I talk to him about all the things in my life. When I'm even being tempted, if I'm getting tempted, I'll say, look at my heart, Lord, know me. I'm being tempted right now with this, and I want you to see it. I want you to see, Lord, what I'm going through. I want you to know my thoughts. I'm getting upset, Lord. If I'm getting upset, I look at me, Lord. Look at, uh, you know, I'm getting emotional and I'm bringing this to you so that you could help me. Look at how I feel. And it's just so glorious. It's the resurrection means that Jesus lives in you. It's a person that lives in you that is your peace, that is your joy, that is your acceptance, that he accepts you. And he lets you know that he accepts you. He lets you know that he loves you and that he's not holding your sins against you. So, We're going to close with this. 
How many of you know what, and I think I've shared this with you before, diplomatic immunity? You guys know what diplomatic immunity is? Okay, so this is a, a, a doctrine in international law. If you have diplomats that are living in another country, ambassadors, this is international law. When you go to their country, you cannot, you're not held to their laws. So a, a diplomat can drive fast, get you know, speeding tickets. He could run red lights if they wanted to. They could park anywhere. As soon as the police officer goes to give them a ticket, they just show their identification. I'm a diplomat, and I'm under diplomat. And this is not only true for the diplomat, but for their kids and for their wife or their husband. If she's the, dis the, the diplomat, they live in New York. We got uh, diplomats from all over the world living in our country, representing their interests for their countries, their ambassadors. Those people cannot be prosecuted. And there was a case years ago about a, a diplomat's wife who was drunk. She got in a car in New York and killed a kid. And they arrested her, she was drunk, they brought her to the police station, and then their lawyers from their country, from the embassy came and they said, you know, you gotta let this lady go, she's a diplomat, she's, un she's under immunity. She got in a plane, Phew, the whole family took off. The parents were outraged, these people killed my, my kid. But, okay, so this is what happens now. When Jesus lives in you, we are like ambassadors for Christ. And we, as far as God is concerned, we have diplomatic immunity. He's not holding our sins against us. Now, does this mean that you're going to be irresponsible and just, oh, yeah, I'm going to break all the laws? No, you're, it's not like that. But for those of you that are feeling condemned all the time, once you accepted the Lord, he entered into your heart. You are a forgiven person. You are already forgiven. You're acquitted. You are justified. Just like you've never done it. For all your past sins, Jesus discharged the mortgage for all of your future sins. He paid 30 years of your payments of your sins going forward. And you have no culpability if you do. Now, this is a shocker. It is such good news that religious people can't, and oh, this is crazy, because that means that people are going to be sinning like crazy. But I'm not telling you to sin like crazy. I'm telling you, I'm not giving you a license to go do this. God isn't. Actually, the opposite is true. Because once the Holy Spirit truly comes into your heart, you change. He starts taking those desires to sin, to worry. You know, worrying is a sin anyway. Did you know that? Anxiety, just stressing out, those are sinful things. Those are, so he wants to take that out of your heart. He wants to help you with that. So, you know, people think, well, that's a license to sin. That is not a license to sin. I, I don't issue a license. I'm not, I don't work for the motor, Department of Motor Vehicle. I certainly do not issue a license for people to be sinning. Actually, the opposite you will find when Jesus truly enters a person's heart they will change by the Holy Spirit. He changes the desires of your heart as you learn, as we learn, as I learn, to live with the Lord in my life. He, the desires to be loved, he fills it. He'll love me in ways that no one can love me. He will accept me in ways that no one can accept me. Completely, fully, like only God can do. He will have mercy on me. He will say such wonderful things to me. You know, everybody needs that. You need to be told, hey, you're appreciated. You're, you're, you know, you did this really well. Thank you so much for being this and for doing this. You know, there's some people that never hear that from anyone. No one ever says, hey, good job. You did awesome. Thank you for that. That really helped me. They never will hear. And so you can get so depressed because we need this. But when Jesus, he'll tell you that. The Lord will show you that he appreciates you. That he, uh, that you're valuable. You know, sometimes people don't feel like they're very valuable in life. I'm like, my life means nothing. My life is just terrible. No, no, you know what? Not to the Lord, you're not. You're extremely valuable. And when he enters into your heart, he begins to communicate these things to you. So it's not a license of sin, but it's just something to be grateful for. Lord Jesus, that you are not holding my sins against me. What Jesus did on the cross was discharging the debt, the sin debt. Um, that is something that you could not do. There is not a human that can cleanse yourself from sin. It's just impossible. We won't have time today to talk about it, but 
in a future Bible study. You cannot. It's a stain that you can scrub for eternity with Clorox, and it never comes off. Your sin is you cannot get it off of you. You needed God to do this. Only God can do it. And then when he enters into you, this person that lives in you is your justification, is your righteousness, is your holiness, is your glorification. If he were to leave me, none of that would be true. I would not be saved. I would not be holy. I would not be justified. But because Christ is in me, he is all of those things for me. So salvation is a person. And I used to think that be a good person, ask God to forgive you every day for everything, and then when you die, hopefully, hopefully, I'll be saved and I'll go to heaven. Those are two different things. Those are two very different things. A person is saved when the Lord enters their heart, just like Jesus said. Their sins are forgiven. And this is the last verse I'm going to share with you in 1 Corinthians 15, 16. The Greeks, the Corinthians were Greeks, and they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. So they had a very difficult time with Paul believing that Jesus, yeah, I could believe he died on the cross, that he was the son of God, but this idea of him raising from the dead, that, that, you know, we don't believe that here in Greece. So Paul, in this chapter, he gives an apologetic that how could you not believe in the resurrection? Because Christianity is founded on that, that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus is God, that he then lives in you and you're saved, and he provides righteousness, sanctification, everything that you need when he lives in you. Not everybody is saved, you're going to have to embrace Jesus, understand what he's done, and then accept what he's done. So in verse 16, uh, Paul is talking about the importance of the resurrection. He says, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Because they didn't believe that people would rise from the dead, the Greeks. So he says, well, then if, if that's the case, then Jesus didn't rise either. Verse 17 the consequences of that belief would be, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, empty. You are what? Still in your sins. In other words, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then there's no verification that God accepted his sacrifice for our sins, that, that what he did on the cross was valid. He just died him like everybody else. Why would we accept his life as full payment for our sin? But the fact is that he did rise from the dead. He says if he didn't rise, then you're, you're still, you are still in your sins. But the fact is that Jesus did rise from the dead. What he did is extremely valid and valuable. And we are no longer in our sins. That is the converse of that verse. If he didn't rise, you're still in your sins. But if, in fact, he did rise from the dead, you are no longer in your sins. You are no longer in your sins. Once Jesus enters into your heart, you are no longer in your sins. They've been discharged. You've been acquitted. You've been justified. You have been forgiven. The debt has been canceled. God the Father sees his son in your heart. God sees the spirit, his life in you, and he knows that you have come to him the right way. Like Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except they come through me, and that's how you have come to God. How many of you come by because you gave so much money? None, none of you have. A true story. I, I was in another church, and the treasurer, after a Sunday, says, actually, I was in Miami. He calls me. I was at another church in Miami. And he calls me from Puerto Rico after they had the service. He goes, Pastor Dan, what? He says, we got a check for $270,000 today. And I said, oh, really? It's, maybe it's drug dealers. You better call the bank because that's a lot of money, $270,000 in, in a check. So Monday came, you know, JP calls the bank, and the bank says, no, he's a very wealthy man. The, the check's good, because the check came in the bank's name. Like the, and he didn't want to be known. He was a member in the church. It's a much bigger church. He didn't want anyone to know that he was giving the two. So, um, and it was to, to meet a need, to discharge a, a need. So this is what Jesus did. He paid already. And all he says is, believe me. Believe what I've done for you and receive me. And you will begin to experience my life, the life of God, in your heart, walking with you every day, with you in every season of your life. Him there to tell you that he loves you, that he's forgiven you, that he sees no wrong in you. And then when you fail, and, and I do, and when you get tempted, I can talk to God. 
I do. I say, look at Lord, I'm being tempted by this. Know me. Look at my heart, God. I know you see already, so I want to be an open book to you, God. I'm being tempted with this. Lord, I'm being tempted to worry about this, or I'm being stressed out about this. And it's just so wonderful. He is so wonderful. So, um, and, and this is going to tie right into the next text. We talked about the paradox of life. Just remember what I'm telling you now, because next week when we look at Jesus saying, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life, well, this is what he's talking about, is receiving him into your life. And then living life is now living it with what he's already giving you. Instead of trying to live your life, trying to get something from God, he's now showing you that you're to live life with what he's already giving you. That's how we go through this life. Not say, God, give me this and God. And I do sometimes, but that's not the way I think. It's, thank you, Lord. Show me what you've already given me so I can live with what you've given me. Instead of, God, give me this because I want this. It's, no, Lord, you've already given me. And it's a completely different paradigm to live this life living with God, living with what you already have. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you rose.